On behalf of uh, SEPS, uh, it is my pleasure today to welcome you all to the second uh, and final EU-Japan uh, dialogue. Uh, the first, uh, some of you uh, recall, was about two weeks or exactly two weeks uh, earlier, uh, where we were comparing notes between the EU and Japan uh, strategies uh, relating to climate change, industrial modernization, uh, and also the wider uh, sustainability agenda. And we were discussing uh, very strongly focused on the recovery uh, plans, on the recovery strategies. Uh, therefore, that first meeting was much more on the environmental side. Today, uh, we are focusing more on the industrial uh, elements and see if and how the two economies, which are the third and the fifth biggest uh, globally in terms of GDP, uh, can transform uh, the global value chains in line with their climate and uh, circularity or sustainability objective. Uh, we all know that Japan has the green growth strategy, the EU has its European uh, Green Deal. There are similarities uh, and all some uh, differences. Uh, this uh, industrial focus is very much also uh, in line with our uh, lineup of speakers. We start with about the 15 minutes introduction uh, by uh, Yukihiro Kawaguchi, who is the Director of Global Environmental Affairs Office uh, at the Ministry for Economy, Trade and Industry of the Government of Japan. And he has some uh, Brussels uh, background as he was around here a few years ago. Then we have comments by uh, the other speakers. First of all, Peter Handley, whose responsibility includes the energy intensive industries and raw material in DG Grow. So that is also getting us into quite a broader global uh, perspective. And then we have Professor Yukari Takamura uh, at the Institute of uh, Future Init Initiatives at the Tokyo University uh, and Jan Tukat from Unicor who will provide us, I assume Jan, a, a global value chain perspective or at least some of uh, the elements there. So very much a warm welcome to all of you and thank you for being available uh, today. Uh, before we kick off the discussions, uh, a few points of uh, housekeeping. Uh, we would like to have as uh, an, inter an active uh, discussion as possible. Pl please uh, try to, to engage. Uh, there's possibility to speak up uh, if you raise the hand or if you prefer put your comments into the chat. Uh, my colleague uh, Milan Elke about uh, we'll monitor that and we'll bring uh, the, the different questions, comments in a grouped way uh, to these discussions. And should you not uh, have, uh, you know, be signed in with your full name, please do so that we know who you are. Sometimes we have this iPhone of uh, whatever, Monica. So if you just put your name that we know uh, who you are. Um, now, uh, I would like uh, therefore now to start with uh, Yukihiro Kawaguchi from uh, METI to kick, us, kick off uh, the discussion of this webinar. Yukihiro, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for your introduction. And uh, my name is Yukihiro Kawaguchi and uh, I'm in charge of international relations in, uh, of the uh, climate change issue in our Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry in Japan. And uh, I'm really glad that I can. I was invited to this event by SEPS because uh, as uh, Chris has uh, introduced, I have very much af uh, uh, affection to the EU because I have been in the EU for oh, like uh, for, uh, three years. And uh, uh, you know, it, it's glad, but on the other hand, it's a little bit sad because uh, I missed the chance to visit Brussels by this <laughs> event so that, uh, but anyway, uh, I think uh, I have many friends in the EU, so that uh, I hope uh, I can, uh, you know, or contribute to discussion on the issue of climate change to, uh, you know, facilitate the uh, partnership between the EU and Japan. So, uh, uh, again, as I think I can, I, I, you, you can see the, my presentation, and uh, based on this presentation, I introduce you what Japan is doing and what we are hitting on fitting for and uh, uh, and uh, it could be some kind of the 
uh, uh, food for thought for our discussion on how we can uh, strengthen our partnership on this field. So, uh, so let's start from the next slide, please. So uh, again, uh, this is a basis uh, on our current uh, Japan policy because you know I think many of you uh, uh, must know very well, but uh, uh, our Prime Minister Suga has uh, declared uh, carbon neutrality by 2050. And actually after this uh, uh, declaration, uh, uh, many things have uh, been changed uh, so that uh, actually, and uh, my way of job has been changed. So it's really a revolutionary declaration. And uh, 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 on top of the uh, declaration on carbon neutrality, neutrality there are some hints on how uh, how we are tackling on on this issue and uh, you can see some wording from his speech and uh, I, I i picked up some words uh, from his declaration and the first one is he says that uh, you know or the carbon neutrality and the strategy on it is actually the growth strategy this is what he said and also, oh, of course, he said that achieving 2050 carbon neutrality and that this could be an economic growth. And uh, in the downward, you can see uh, what he said is that, that the key is uh, innovation. And that uh, we need to uh, have, uh, promote green investment. What he said is, again, the, the goal to the carbon neutrality is really tough. It's really tough. And uh, uh, that's why uh, we clearly need uh, innovation and to encourage innovation, we need to promote investment. By doing so, we can uh, encourage a kind of a budget cycle between economy and the environment. Uh, so this is a key e strategy e of uh, carbon neutrality. So next slide, please. Okay, so uh, again, the road to uh, 2050 is really uh, far uh, and uh, it's really difficult. But uh, 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 currently, uh, of course, we are tackling and, uh, you know, just saying the words or just saying that uh, a goal is easy, but the more important thing is uh, what we do and our action is really uh, important. And that this is uh, really the uh, uh, this slide shows the uh, uh, greenhouse gas emission since 2013. The base year here is 2013. The reason why that is Japan's NDC. Japan's NDC is the basis has been put in 2030. And uh, actually, that was a uh, uh, base. We put that base year just after the uh, Paris Agreement. And uh, that's why uh, we put that basis here. And since then, uh, we had a lot of effort to reduce the greenhouse gas emission. And uh, it has been actually uh, reduced by 14%. And uh, the UK has been reduced uh, more than 21, 20%. But among the G7 countries, uh, the Japan is a second to the UK. So oh, we have made a lot of effort to, towards the goal and actually that's an uh, importance of action. And next slide, please. And of course, uh, there are many uh, you know, indicators to uh, 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 assess the action, but uh, let me, uh, I cannot introduce all of the action, but let, uh, let me introduce and uh, touch upon the renewable energy. And uh, you know, this, uh, the left-hand side, uh, you can see that, uh, 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 okay, so uh, in 2020, uh, 2012, uh, the ratio of renewable energy in Japan was uh, like a 10% now, uh, and uh, currently we are uh, uh, moving to 70%. And then uh, we have clearly energy mix by 2030s, and uh, it, that energy mix shows that our uh, kind of the uh, mix on renewable energy is 20% to 20%. Percent, so that uh, the renewable energy is, uh, you know, or ratio is moving and uh, increasing. And uh, you can see the right hand side. Uh, you know, if you look at the uh, absolute number, uh, of course it's smaller than, of course, uh, compared to the EU or Germany. But uh, how it has been increased, you can see uh, that the Japan the renewable energy ratio uh, has been increased by 3.1 times. It's larger than the other region or the uh, other countries. So 
now uh, again it shows that our uh, how to say effort uh, on how we are tackling on this issue so next slide please and uh, uh, this this slide also shows uh, the uh, indicator on how we are tackling on energy conservation and, and so on this uh, shows the international comparison of steel energy in intensity and uh, uh, and uh, you can see is that uh, Japan's uh, uh, efforts uh, on steel production uh, as a result uh, our primary energy intensity intensity on steel production as the lowest uh, among the other countries in the, uh, the country here in this zone. So oh, this is again clearly a short. And actually the reason why I picked up this uh, slide is, you know, oh, one of the issues which we can discuss on this uh, issue uh, uh, on this panel is uh, trade and uh, uh, environment. And sometimes there's a, a, a discussion on the steel production. So I just uh, uh, put this uh, uh, slide uh, in this uh, uh, presentation. Okay, so next slide, please. So oh, 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 actually, again, the, uh, 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 the road to uh, uh, 2050 target is really uh, far away. And uh, uh, you know how we can achieve the carbon neutrality. And uh, you can see that uh, in, in the left hand side, uh, 2018, uh, you know, oh, of course, uh, we have the CO2 emission of 1.06 uh, billion tons. And uh, we need to uh, be net neutral. And the current, uh, if we achieve the 2030 mix, it could the GHG emission could be less than one billion ton. So how we can achieve the uh, carbon neutrality? First, if you look at the non-electricity sector, uh, of course, we need to increase the portion of electric electrification. Uh, and uh, of course, if you look at the vehicle, we need to introduce more electric vehicle. And uh, uh, and also we need to change the way of production of steel uh, from uh, coal to hydrogen and so on. So as a result, uh, you know, of course, uh, 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 electricity demand will be increased by 30 or 50%. And of course, still, uh, even in non-electric sector, uh, there are still, uh, 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 you know, uh, exist uh, the uh, uh, usage of fossil fuel. So there could be a CO2 emission, but uh, what the solution to this portion is, of course, a usage of CCUS. And also, if we look at the electricity sector, of course, all the, we try to uh, uh, deco decarbonize the electric source. And that there is a, uh, you can see some uh, reference number. This is not a, a number of energy mix and so on. This is just a reference for discussion uh, in our current discussion in Japan. And uh, what we put as a number is that uh, uh, renewable could be 50 to 60%. And the portion of nuclear thermal plus CCS could be 30 to 40%. And also oh, we can use the uh, uh, hydrogen and ammonia as a 10%. This is still a, a reference number, but uh, uh, you know, oh, for the discussion, we put this number. And of course, uh, we still need a uh, uh, CCUS uh, for the thermal power. So anyway, CCUS and also uh, is important and also plantation or tax as a negative emission uh, technology is important. Next slide, please. And uh, this is just an image of industry uh, because uh, the key is again the uh, the the line by uh, orange is uh, electricity, and uh, of course we uh, get uh, electricity from renewable. And uh, in the center, this is in Japanese, but uh, you know storage is really important battery storage. And also or, or hydrogen could be the uh, key technology for all sector. And uh, because uh, uh, you know, today's uh, theme uh, is uh, you know, or, uh, circularity. So I put the CO2 in green, you know, or, and uh, you know, CO2 could be also or recycled and uh, it could be recycled uh, in the uh, in the methanation together with CCS and uh, so on. So that, uh, you know, even CO2, we need to use it as a, a resource. And uh, sometimes we also need to put uh, underground by CCS. 
So this kind of image could be the, I think, more or less common between the EU and Japan. So, and next slide, please. So oh, that's, uh, and uh, again, we have put a green growth strategy in the end of last year, and uh, we set an ambitious goal or to induce companies' investment. And uh, within this strategy, we have uh, uh, a specified action plan for 14 growing industry sector and uh, five cross-sectoral policies. And uh, you can see the 14 growing industry sector uh, in the below, you know, of course, offshore wind, ammonia, hydrogen, nuclear, and, and also even the uh, mobility and so on. And also in the downside uh, and the right hand side, lifestyle related industry is also important uh, because I think this is also the same as the EU, you know, lifestyle change is uh, really important for the achievement of 2050 carbon neutrality. That's why we set this as a key, one of the key technologies. And next slide, please. So all five cross uh, sectoral policy, and uh, uh, of course we use a uh, grant funding. Uh, uh, we are now uh, put a green innovation fund with two trillion yen, which is approximately sixteen billion euros over ten years. And by doing uh, by this fund, we can stimulate uh, private R and D and investment, and also the, the tax investment. And regulatory reform is also important uh, for all new technologies such as hydrogen offshore. And also oh, we need to discuss on the issue uh, like uh, carbon pricing, including carbon border adjustment. Uh, it could be discussed uh, among uh, uh, EU and Japan, how we can make it effectively. And also in national cooperation is uh, of course important. So oh, again, uh, this is just an overview. And uh, I think what you can see is that it is a common issue between the EU and Japan, uh, and uh, even on the policy side, but also the technology side. So that, uh, you know, there is a, that means there's much room uh, for our discussion to strengthen between the EU and Japan in this uh, field. Okay, this is uh, it, and uh, I hope uh, uh, we can uh, have a, a discussion later on. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah Yukihiro, thank you very much uh, for highlighting a number uh, of points. Um, I was intrigued by the slide number five, the efficiency of uh, steel uh, of Japan, and I'm not not it certainly has some implications for the carbon border adjustment mechanism. I'm not gonna raise that issue now because I'm sure it will be brought up later and I haven't been in a climate meeting for the last year without this issue coming up so let's uh, stick it there but uh, I was also intrigued by the uh, by the hydrogen discussion certainly where will that hydrogen come from global value chain hopefully we can look at this later on and then of course the CC US or CCS discussion is interesting but can I have uh, two uh, more, you know, practical uh, questions. The first is relating again to the steel efficiency, the efficiency of the steel industry. If you look at chemicals or cement, uh, that's the first question. Would we see similar figures or did you pick the steel, which you are most efficient <laughs> and the others may not be as, as good as that one? And the second one is uh, on the innovation fund you, you mentioned. Uh, R&D and investment. So how do you share between the R&D and really driving the deployment? I understand that's the investment part. And also, how do you actually allocate the money? Uh, in, in Europe, we do uh, competitive tenders, if you wish. Uh, and how do you allocate uh, the, mo uh, the, the money in, in, in these two? So uh, please. Okay, uh, on the, uh, you know, comparison of uh, intensity, uh, you know, I don't have a concrete number on it, but basically uh, uh, on the, uh, how to say, the uh, industry side, uh, on the production on chemical or uh, steel and so on, you know, Japan has a lot of the strengths in producing on it. So basically uh, the intensity uh, of uh, uh, energy intensity uh, should be uh, uh, higher. So oh, I think, uh, 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 let's take the uh, chemical. I think, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have a number, but uh, uh, I have similar uh, picture on it. So that's one thing, uh, but uh, of course it depends on the, uh, you know, or field, I think. 
So this is the first thing. And second thing, uh, how we can allocate the money of innovation fund. Uh, basically, we are still designing uh, the, uh, this, uh, how we can implement this uh, innovation fund. But uh, first, uh, uh, the field uh, in which the innovation fund could be introduced is again, the uh, 14, sec uh, centrally 14 growing uh, industry sector, which was specified in the green growth strategy. That, that the reason why we have specified 14 sector is that you know we put more resources in this uh, sector. This is uh, first how we can allocate money to uh, which field, and also uh, for the if we look or think about the implementation again, this is really important. R and D is important, but also the implementation or introduction to the society is important. That, and that, that's why uh, in the growing strategy, uh, we see many focus on the how we can introduce uh, this uh, uh, technology to the society. And uh, also what is important is that when we allocate this money to the, uh, to the technology, what we need is commitment by the uh, companies. You know, sometimes company uh, try to get the money for just their R&D without implementation. That's why what now we are introduced in the uh, designing of this uh, uh, fund is, you know, we try to get uh, the commitment by the top of the uh, companies and so on. And uh, how they uh, put their, uh, this technology to their central strategy of company. You know, this is the point, but uh, in detail, we are still, how we can get that kind of commitment, we are still designing it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Very clear. Uh, the other, there is many other question already. The chat is 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 uh, filling gradually with a, a number of questions you would expect that you can uh, prepare. Uh, Peter, uh, you know, can we go over to you? Uh, what you know? What would your take be on what you have heard, or also? how that uh, EU strategy relates or the Japan strategy relates to the EU. Peter. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for a, for a very interesting presentation. I think uh, I would make three sort of key points, um, all beginning with an S. So uh, the first one is I think we have shared challenges. Uh, the second is I think we have similar but not identical approaches. And the third is there is already, and I see potential for much uh, more strong cooperation between between Japan and the EU. Um, I won't go into detail on the challenges. I think you had those addressed at length in the last uh, seminar, but I mean, just the key words are, it's about the ecological challenge, it's the digital challenge, and it's about making sure that we come out of the COVID-19 crisis much more resilient. Uh, and the language that we have in Europe at the moment is about um, uh, open strategic autonomy or expressed by the European Council, uh, as a principle of Europe is now strategic autonomy in a global, open global economy. Um, I think where we have the similarities on uh, how we are addressing these challenges. So we have the European Green Deal. This is Europe's new growth strategy and the industrial uh, strategy is a, a key part of this because the challenges of shifting a whole economy away from fossil fuels uh, means you have to, uh, you have to, to transform industry and all other sectors of the economy. Um, so we are trying to provide policy signals and policy stability going forward. So already we've announced that we're gonna come out with the Fit for 55 package in the summer where your favorite uh, Christian CBAM will be one of the proposals, but also tightening up the level of ambition for the, the ETS and for renewables and energy efficiency. Um, and we're also going to be coming out with um, uh, an updated industrial strategy one month from now. This will build on what we came out with last March, but draw the lessons from COVID-19 in terms of resilience. We're going to do an in-depth look at, um, uh, as requested by the European Council, into strategic vulnerabilities um, and what to do about them. This is very similar to what uh, Biden has asked his administration to do under the executive order from the 24th of February. Uh, we're going to take an in-depth look at the industrial ecosystems, which is the way that we're now trying to understand how things fit together, supply chain, but also the products and services, 
the small and medium enterprises and the larger companies and how the research network fits in with with the industrial side. So there's a whole bunch of things going on at the moment. And we're also looking very much at the sustainable products initiative. So this is how you can really look at the footprint, the life cycle approach of products put on the European market. Uh, I, would, I would illustrate how we're approaching uh, industrial policy now by saying, look at what we're doing on batteries. Okay, today there is a European Batteries Alliance uh, ministerial. There'll be some announcements coming out of there, but we're bringing together the different actors across the supply chain. We've got uh, the European Batteries Alliance, and we also have the European Raw Materials Alliance now. We've had two important projects of common European interest adopted for batteries. These go from raw materials through to recycling, everything in between. And for 6 billion euros of uh, state aid, you get 15 billion euros of private investment. So it's a very strong leverage effect. And the other thing on batteries we're doing is we are looking at the due diligence of what goes into the supply chain. We are looking at uh, ambitious recycling targets and future minimum recycled content for future batteries. So the idea of alliances, um, consortia, bringing industry and member states together, uh, deploying state aid judiciously to support private investment, all these are things that we're doing. Um, and I think also a number of the policy things we've heard from Japan are very similar. We've come out with a hydrogen strategy, sector integration strategy. Um, we're going to be coming out with a methane strategy uh, later this year. So there's a whole bunch of things that are, are similar, similar. I'm sure we can get into more of that in Q&A. Technology is very important. And you know, Christian, that we've done a lot of work with the energy intensive industries to develop a master plan and have the pathways for the technology uh, breakthroughs that are needed. And we're going to provide all the support we can for that through a combination of uh, research and innovation funding, innovation funding, and then invest EU and other, and other things. And let's not forget the one off opportunity of the, the massive recovery fund, where we're strongly encouraging member states to use the opportunity to accelerate investments in decarbonizing industry. I will skip now to the cooperation uh, heading. Uh, Europe and Japan already cooperate a lot in various international fora, notably in the G7, G20, but we also have the, the trilateral on critical raw materials, which uh, is more relevant than ever at the moment. If you look at the geopolitical issues around rare earths and, and permanent magnets, for example. Um, and we also have very close bilateral cooperation. We have, we have the economic partnership agreement, which has a very strong chapter to it about sustainability, and a commitment to having a level playing field globally without weakening environmental and social standards. We have the, the EU-Japan industrial dialogue, and that will be meeting with my director general in the chair on our side in a month's time, looking at uh, robotics, looking at uh, automotive, looking at critical raw materials, looking at standardization, uh, another area of very close cooperation. And then, and then finally, we have um, the uh, uh, the, the, Euro, the EU Japan Industry Days next week. My commissioner, uh, Commissioner Breton, will be speaking there. I think there's many avenues where we can have very constructive uh, partnership between Japan and the European Union as we together try to decarbonize industries like steel, cement, uh, and chemicals. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, you raised the issue of uh, strategic autonomy or strategic vulnerability. Um, uh, Yukihiro, I didn't hear uh, so much about this in your presentation. Of course, you couldn't cover anything, everything at the same time. But how do you uh, attack, uh, address this? You know, J Japan is, is an island, you know, very... Uh, few, if any, uh, raw material, certain technological options are hard uh, to, to handle. You are in a, a bit of a delicate international environment and, and all of this. Uh, so that, you know, would be something interesting, perhaps exploring a bit. And also we are thinking in the EU and in Germany that it's proposed to think about the supply chain law. Uh, would Japan also want to go all the way uh, to this, or is this discussed, uh, etc.? 
And uh, to Peter, I have just a question that the Battery Alliance, I think huge success. And probably in the beginning, when you started this, uh, you, you, a lot of people were saying, what the hell are you doing? You know, it will never work. And it, it worked very, very uh, quickly and it worked well. It probably also works for hydrogen, I, I would imagine. But I'm not so sure how you can apply uh, this to more complex value chains, uh, to other to the energy intensive industries uh, you are sort of having in your portfolio. If your sort of product is simple, I mean, battery is not simple, but it is a relatively defined value chain. In other parts, it may be less, uh, uh, less uh, uh, you know, defined. You know, this is, uh, you know, perhaps after Yukihiro has been, you know, answering or speaking about the strategic autonomy and the, the supply chain law, Peter, maybe then afterwards. Yukihiro, would you be able to, to comment on this? I'm sorry, so supply chain on especially raw materials? But also the strategic autonomy, the strategic vulnerabilities, how do you addressing this in Japan? On value chain or supply chain, uh, you mean? Yeah, uh, yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's really a difficult question, but uh, you know, clearly, uh, you know, or supply chain is really a critical for the, especially for the manu manufacturing industry in Japan, you know, because all, th all the things or, and materials are interconnected, especially if we look, because you have in Japan, there is a strong uh, connection with the Asian countries. That's why uh, we need to tackle on that. That's why we see the, a lot of uh, focus on the uh, Asian or ASEAN country, especially, you know, that's why, you know, what, what, what we need to emphasize more on is how we, not only on the decarbonization or the reducing the GHG in Japan, but also in Asian region, you know. And also, if you look at the uh, uh, decarbonization, there's, on the other hand, there's another resource in, in other uh, value chain, if, 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 of course, in Asia, for example, the potential of solar power or wind power, even the storage potential of CCS. So that uh, like the EU, you know, if you look at only one of the uh, countries, uh, there is a still a small potential. But if you look at the EU side, there is a many interconnection even in electricity or greenhouse gas emission. So that uh, if we look at the regionally in the, uh, a together with Asia, uh, you know, there is a, a much potential uh, how we can tackle on this uh, issue uh, as a value chain or supply chain. This is a really conceptual answer. Okay, uh, thank you. So I think we are struggling in Europe with a similar uh, situation. We know that in 2030, Russian and Turkish emissions will be higher jointly than the one of the EU and the UK. So unless you address this, we are not uh, really uh, addressing climate change. So I think here is a new area of cooperation, which I'm sure is already happening. The external dimension of the green growth strategy and the external dimension of uh, the European Green Deal. Uh, yeah, Peter. If you know, if you may want to 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 answer the question on the the alliances. Yeah, well, we're not going to throw alliances at every problem. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> as we say in the uh, industrial strategy from last March, they have their place where you've got um, a problem uh, and where you can want to achieve solutions at, at European scale. Okay, so the benefit of an alliance is when there's a when there's a need and when there's a useful uh, task for it to do, which is the case for, um, for, for the batteries, it's the case also for um, the plastics, um, uh, for hydrogen as well. And by the way, as of next Tuesday in DG Grow, I will become uh, responsible also for the Hydrogen Alliance and helping to steer the IPCI along uh, for, for hydrogen. Um, now, as far as the, the hard to abate sectors are concerned, the energy intensive sectors, the ball is very much in their court. You know, they know they, they know the different technologies. They know what they can expect from us in terms of European support for research and innovation and beyond. Is there any particular vehicle that they want to help this uh, happen faster? Well, we've already said use the use the national recovery plans. That's one quick thing you can do. But as to whether they want an alliance, an industrial alliance, or an IPCI they need to come out clearly and say what it is that's most most useful for them. And if it's an IPCI, of course, this has to come from member states. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, now, we are moving uh, to the third speaker, Yukari Takamura. Uh, please, uh, you know, it's time for your comments and then a few questions. It's good to have you back again. So welcome sort of in Brussels, <laughs> whatever this means. <laughs> Please. Also in Serbia. <laughs> so thank you very much, uh, you know, the especially Seps and Christian and Milan for this opportunity with a wonderful panelist. Uh, could I share my slide? I, I think I, if I may. Um, yeah. Yeah, great. Thank you. So, um, Thank you very, uh, again, uh, I think I understand that the Kawaguchi-san already talked about the Japanese uh, pledge uh, commitment uh, toward the uh, trend, uh, climate neutrality by 2050. So I, I, I think I'm not definitely repeated, but uh, uh, already this, uh, you know, the uh, commitment goal, uh, long-term goal uh, of Japan have a clear impact uh, on the governmental policy uh, uh, as well as uh, non-state actor behavior, including businesses. And I focus, uh, my comment focus on the business actors uh, behavior change towards the, the uh, uh, climate neutrality by 2050. So um, uh, just before going <laughs> to this topic, I, I, I think I just, uh, uh, you know, the uh, wish to introduce this some uh, you know, element included in our Prime Minister's first policy uh, speech, uh, this, uh, I think this just uh, the last October. So with his uh, announcement of long-term goal, uh, I think this uh, speech actually showed that uh, quite a drastic change on the political narrative in terms of the climate actions, because the, uh, he said that aggressive climate action will bring transformation of industrial structure and economy and society Japan, uh, which lead to higher uh, economic growth. So this, you can see that it clear link between the some moderniza modernization of Japanese industrial structure and climate action. So, of course, he mentioned that some keyword, a disruptive innovation, R&D, a regulatory reform, green investment, and green industry. And as well, of course, the energy policy is a kind of key factor, especially to determine our course of the uh, climate neutrality by 2050. So in terms of energy policy, he mentioned that the energy consent conservation together with the renewable energy uh, introduction as much as possible. And also the, he mentioned that the drastically change in policy, change policy on coal fire plant. So now I move on to the, the uh, you know, the uh, non-state actors uh, change uh, toward the, the uh, climate neutrality by 2050. Um, local authority in Japan also moving toward uh, climate neutrality, already more than 300 local authority covering actually the, uh, you know, the 10, no, not 10, and 100 million population <laughs> has now declared the, the similar pledge to reach carbon neutral by 2050. But the more striking, strikely, strikingly, the, the business is moving ahead even before government. So it, it, uh, you might know that it's a global uh, initiative, a uh, science-based target, which requests the company to reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, uh, in line with the long-term goal of the Paris Agreement. So, uh, of course, globally, we count uh, more than 1,200 uh, 1, companies, but uh, uh, we, you can see that the, quite a number of uh, Japanese company, uh, which I, I, I'm sure that you, uh, they, of which, uh, 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 I mean, the name of which you are quite familiar with, like a Sony and the Panasonic and others. So uh, of course, out, uh, out beyond this initiative, uh, you can see that uh, many automobile companies and uh, uh, you know energy providers 
and uh, also transporters, transporting company, it's also joined to this uh, commitment. Uh, very surprisingly, the uh, oil and the gas uh, provider, such a, as the NAOs, Impex, and others, also committed themselves to, uh, you know, this climate neutrality by 2040 for NAOs and uh, 2050 for Impex and uh, Idemitsu. So um, why business actually, uh, you know, this uh, taken such kind of lead uh, towards the climate neutrality by 2050? Mm -hmm. I think the uh, one of the initial uh, one of the factor coming from the financial institution investor, which focus on the ESG investing, and another uh, factor I, I would say that the uh, it's come from the 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 uh, some kind of supply chain because the uh, downstream supplier especially and the supply chain request upstream supplier to reduce uh, manage greenhouse gases and also reduce them uh, towards the decarbonizing its supply chain. So um, you can see here again the the uh, Japanese uh, Japan Association of Corporate Executive request the government to uh, make the, the uh, you know, renewable energy up to, uh, increase up to 40% uh, in the power mix in 2030. And also, I, I just uh, introduced, uh, you know, some remarks by the Mr. Nakanishi, chairman of the Keidan Land Japan Business Federation. Uh, he considered the, the uh, aiming or reaching carbon neutral by 2050 is uh, Peter, of new growth strategy called Green Growth of Japan. So the um, actually the uh, pressure coming from the global or in industry and companies such as Microsoft, for instance, as you might know that Microsoft has a quite ambitious, uh, you know, climate goal such as carbon negative by 2030. But the very interestingly, uh, their focus is now on the reducing a scope three emission. I mean, the emission from all body supply chain and value chain by 2030. Uh, you know, they uh, actually the target is to reduce scope three emission by more than half by 2030. So, to for that purpose. Uh, they uh, 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 they will begin to implement new procurement processes uh, to enable and incentivize uh, the Microsoft supplier to reduce their scope one, two, and the three emissions. Actually, that will start by July of this year. So uh, uh, same thing happened with the Apple. I think I, I skip now, but uh, many. Uh, you know, Japanese company uh, uh, actually the uh, doing uh, the manufacturing process of the Apple product so that they are kindly requested to uh, do their business, uh, you know, by renewable energy, uh, hopefully by 2030. So some then concern arise from the business sector because the uh, you know they uh, are requested to reduce emission and also the uh, procure the renewable energy for their manufacturing process. So in case they couldn't, so they, they might have to go out, move out their uh, manufacturing uh, you know process out of Japan. That is uh, the concern on the on, on the part of Japanese business, especially which are incorporated in the global supply chain of such, you know, the uh, global business like uh, Microsoft and Apple. Japan is the second country which faced the uh, largest business risk in case that the business could not you know, procure renewable energy uh, in line with the request from the supply chain company, uh, I mean, the global uh, supplier, such as these, uh, you know, which are eager to reduce their emission. Uh, one of the reasons why that unfortunately Japan is one of the country with the highest emission intensity among developed countries so that's the uh, uh, that is uh, lead, one of the reasons why that the Japanese business uh, ask government to decarbonize or low carbonize the our energy system. 
So I, I think you already know that financial institution put pressure the company to disclose the climate related financial risk and also engage uh, change or behavior uh, toward the climate action. I think I'm going to skip it. So the two end. Uh, actually, they already the Kawaguchi some mentioned about the, the green growth strategy. I think I focus on the possible area of collaboration between the EU and Japan. So as the Kawaguchi some already introduced that when we talk about the decarbonizing uh, Japanese, uh, you know, the uh, society economy, uh, you know, the decarbonization the energy sector is critical because our CO2 emission from energy use actually accounts for 85% of Japanese GHG emissions. So I think they already Kawaguchi-san cover that then decarbonized power sector and the decarbonized energy sector other than power sector is a quite critical uh, challenge for us. Um, based on that, um, uh, 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 and also the I, I just to uh, I rather the focus two direction, uh, you know, to address uh, you know the challenge facing uh, the Japanese businesses because the uh, one key direction is accelerating the the existing technology introduction to reduce emission as much as possible because the of course one of the reasons is the uh, uh, urgent uh, urgent sense of climate change but uh, uh, again as i mentioned that the japanese media business actually facing the request from the uh, global supply chain so that the uh, reducing emission as much as possible now is the uh, it is a great uh, a greater importance to enhance competitive competitiveness on behalf of Japanese industry. Of course, the, another direction I mean this two uh, another direction is also important because toward the climate neutrality by twenty fifty uh, we have uh, actually we have no complete list to decarbonize our society. So the are. Uh, research and development for the new technology is quite key uh, uh, to achieve it. So, um, of course, there are challenges because the, uh, 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 how to say, the, uh, you know, the, uh, this kind of new technology often involved uncertainty of cost and the feasibility. Uh, if I could say that co technological competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis other technologies, so the uh, how to then the uh, raise the demand and the create market of the such a decarbonizing or low carbon product and services. Uh, that is, I think, one of the area that we could collaborate. Uh, what would be pos a possible solution? And another one is that the building and infrastructure for new technology, not only our technical infrastructure, but also the institutional infrastructure, such as standardization or quality control scheme or regulatory measures. Last, not least, but uh, you know, this new technology uh, require, uh, require the financial flow and the investment. But uh, with the, some certainty uh, in terms of the, the uh, uh, cost and uh, feasibility, uh, they have more difficulty in getting money to develop and uh, diffuse these technologies. So how we could then the uh, focus on the, the uh, catalyze the financial flow and the investment for such a new technology. That is, I think, the third area that the, the possible, uh, you know, the area of collaboration between EU and Japan. So that's my presentation. Thank you very much, Christian. I thank hope. you. Uh, uh, thank you, Takamura-san. Uh, excellent uh, presentation. There were some questions, you know, why this change in situation in Japan in the chat. I think you explained some. We might uh, come back uh, to this uh, later. Um, uh, I was in intrigued uh, by your comments about uh, scope three emissions, etc., etc. Et uh, and but maybe also Jan, as you're coming, maybe you 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 can also 
uh, see a little bit how you measure uh, this COPE 3. But before we go to you, allow me, uh, please, uh, asking uh, one question to Peter, uh, which is about the supply chain pressure. I mean, if I understand the Japanese situation correctly, there was, uh, you know, the change of situation was the municipalities, which, you know, you could say it's the, the people, <laughs> uh, and then the international business supply uh, chain, which is uh, something which we don't discuss that much in the EU. But of course, in Brussels, we are a regulatory machine, so we wouldn't look at these kind of things. But uh, what uh, Takamura said, that was, uh, seemed to me, a very, very important uh, point, uh, which uh, have we discussed this uh, sufficiently, or what is your experience there? <clears throat> the thing about the supply chain vulnerabilities is that uh, in the normal run of things, we have a completely free flowing global economy. But when we have a major disruption, then we see that we may be overexposed because we may have over concentrated sources of supply um, and then we haven't got plan B in place. So a lot of this resilience autonomy discussion is about making sure that there are options in the system. That may mean a bit more cost than the just in time delivery, which we've got uh, used to over the last uh, two to three decades. But um, Clearly, uh, we have to look at um, a diversification of a variety of things. I mean, you can see at the moment, it's not my business, but the whole vaccines issue is about supply chains <laughs> and how freely these flow. Um, so, and that, that is something which comes home to the every, every citizen on the planet. You know, it's something that's inescapable. But we're looking at things which relate to the raw materials, for example. We're looking at things which relate to the, uh, to, to, to the, to the digital side of things. There are vulnerabilities um, and it just means, you know, know what, know what the risks are and then you can work out a plan to deal with it and you can put the investments in the right place. I mean, we see this happening in different parts of the world. Uh, I think just today the Quad is having a meeting about precisely the same kind of issues. And I know that the G7 has been looking into this economic resilience uh, and pinch points. It's, it's about identifying pain points. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, there is, you know, Takamura Sen mentioned also the vulnerability, the economic vulnerability of high carbon being high carbon uh, in the international uh, uh, trade. So that may be another vulnerability, which we haven't looked at it at, 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 at that, uh, in that perspective. Jan, uh, you know, vulnerabilities of supply chains, that's <laughs> your, you know, yeah. some of your, your job, supply mm -hmm. chain law, mm -hmm. uh, and, but also scope three emissions. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know to what extent you can cover some of those, but I think there were quite a lot of uh, points brought up, which seem to be essential for the future as mm -hmm. we go there. Yeah, uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, maybe just a few words uh, to introduce myself. So my name is uh, Jan Tijdgat and I'm working for an, a company called Yumiko. Uh, so Yumiko is what we call uh, a, a, a materials technology and recycling company. Materials technology means that we are transforming uh, base metals or, or, or scarce metals into functional materials. Uh, for instance, we transform lithium, cobalt, nickel, manganese into battery materials for, for lithium ion batteries. And in our business model, at the end of life, we take uh, the materials back to recycle and to produce uh, new materials uh, again. Uh, but I would like to to, uh, to to give a few comments on on what I've heard already, and um, it, it is already a conceptual uh, issue that I would like to raise. And so everyone agrees, and uh, industrialists and uh, and, and the, the, the greater public, uh, that we have to raise the bar when it is about sustainability, when it is about uh, responsible sourcing, about CO two footprint. Uh, we all we all agree, and we all want to do that. Uh, but there is an issue, what's called leakage. And so uh, we can set our bar here, but if we import all those issues that we want to tackle, if we import them in embedded in, in, in materials that are produced outside of our economies, then we have an issue. And I, I would like to illustrate this with just a few examples, um, with a good and a bad example. Um, in, in Europe, we have something that's called uh, the conflict minerals legislation. And the aim of that conflict mineral legislation is to avoid that we would import uh, armed conflicts from, uh, from wherever in the form of, of gold, tungsten, uh, tungsten um, uh, 
and so so and the, the legislator has designed already a leakage and so the the law is a very limited in scope so that means that if you import the metal or the mineral then you are in scope but if you import the gold or the tungsten on the tungsten in a finished product then you are not in scope so uh, that is a designed leakage um, a better example is, uh, for instance, as, as Peter already mentioned, the, the batteries regulation, so the upcoming regulation on, on batteries. Uh, there, they look at it in, an, in a more holistic way and a value uh, chain approach. That means that they do not only look at the uh, raw material as such, but also at the steps in between. And so all the batteries, either the battery materials or the raw materials or the finished uh, battery as such has to comply with uh, due diligence along the value chain and not just the importer of, of the raw material. So that's better. Although that even in the batteries regulation, we see a designed uh, leakage in the sense that the that due diligence re uh, requests or requirements will only apply to large EV and industrial batteries and not in the batteries from uh, electronics. So, but what is the moral difference between child labor in an electric vehicle or child labor in a mobile phone uh, battery? So uh, I think that if the society rightly sets some bars and some minimum requirements, then it has to apply to everyone and, and to all uh, materials. That's an important uh, message I think that I would like to bring. Uh, and uh, it's also, for instance, we're talking about CO2 footprint and, and this kind of, of uh, uh, issues. It's also a question of enforcement. And uh, so referring back to the batteries uh, regulation, uh, so the battery regulation includes, uh, first of all, an, an, uh, transparency, so declaration of the CO2 footprint, and later on a cap on the CO2 footprint of the production phase of batteries. We all agree with that, uh, where the, the principle is, is very good and, and we are glad to see it inside. But the question then will be how to enforce it and how to, to measure that in a, in a way that everyone agrees that with the same uh, principles and um, ex especially for batteries imported uh, from abroad, uh, who will do that check? Will it be a self-declaration? If, if you do a product uh, controls, then, then you can analyze the product and you can see if it's compliant with the rules or not. But with the declaration of a CO2 footprint, who will do that? Uh, who will check the, the validity of that, um, uh, of that uh, declaration? So that's also an important uh, aspect I would like to, uh, to highlight. And then another aspect in, in all uh, value chain and trade related uh, aspects, I think that every time that a rule is uh, reviewed or that we have to, to, to make new rules uh, that we always think in terms of uh, the SDGs. So how does it contribute to a more sustainable and a, how, uh, and a better world? And I just want to give one example here. Uh, the, the Basel Convention on, on Transport of Hazardous Waste. Very good intentions, very well um, conceptually ideas. But when we look at the way how it's implemented, uh, we see that it is not, it, there is no fit really with circular economy. And so it's looking at waste as, an, as, an, as a problem, that it will be dumped somewhere and that we have to avoid that it is illegally dumped or that at least the, the, the authorities from the sending and the receiving countries know uh, about every individual traffic. But waste has to be considered as a raw material. And the whole notification procedure, although we understand why, but should be done in a much better efficient way because today this notification procedure hampers the circular economy. It does not stimulate. It takes months and months uh, for them. Uh, we are talking here with co Japanese colleagues uh, to transport electronic waste from, from Japan to Europe or the other way. It takes months. And at the end of the day, the material is either not recycled or it's recycled according to substandard uh, quality sometimes. And so really we have to think much more in terms of existing or new legislation, how can we fit that with um, the, the objectives of more circularity and more uh, sustainability? So when it is about, uh, to, 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 to come back on your explicit question, Christian, on, uh, on, on uh, the, 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 the scope three emissions, um, well, 
uh, we have a clear policy in our company, and I think that many companies uh, have the same. And so uh, we look as an industry, energy intensive energy, uh, industry. Um, we look at three levels. So we have our own energy production. So wherever we have new um, and uh, production, we look how can we provide our own energy as much as possible. Uh, then we have a system of, of PPA, so the purchasing power agreements, where we invest uh, with local, of, uh, we, we contribute in the uh, local investment of, of uh, energy production. Uh, but we also rely for, for the balance on uh, the European system of uh, certificates of origin. And so we think that that is an important uh, uh, system. Uh, we know that there's some criticism that it does not contribute to new investments or whatever, or that there is uh, or countries claiming that they are very green, but at the other hand, they sell their uh, guarantees of origin. Uh, so um, they are eating from two, two baskets or whatever. Uh, so there is some criticism to give, but I think that we should maybe work to improve the system, but not to abandon the, the, the system. And so it's important that we look at uh, systems and ways how we increase with, because I also um, referred to uh, Mrs. Sakamoto. Um, I, maybe I was not, uh, I did not understand the, the, the Sony story, but if I understand that they are moving away, uh, so that's, a, that's an inverse leakage. If you cannot offer enough uh, renewable energy in, in the country, uh, that companies go away from uh, the country to, to where there's more uh, green energy. So we really have, as, as, a, as a community, as a society, we really have to, 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 to pick up those, those signals and to make sure that indeed we uh, create an environment where investments in green energy are stimulated. And we believe that indeed a combination as an industry, own production, PPA, and uh, guarantees of origin, that that's combination of the three uh, should be developed and yeah and if I fully agree that there are ways to improve uh, but uh, we have to work on it okay uh, thank you uh, thank you uh, Jan uh, for putting this in a in a, in a practical uh, context and you see I mean it's it's the devil is in the detail <laughs> absolutely and of yeah, course yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And of course, we have legacy, and you mentioned uh, the, the the convention on, on on waste, and you mentioned the, the, the guarantees of origin. But you know, they now need all to be uh, brought into into line with these new uh, requirements, and that will take some uh, yeah. time. No, I I have plenty of questions, but yeah. that should not be the point um, at the moment. But I don't know, uh, you know, uh, Jan. Before my colleague Milan will sort of uh, come up bring some of the chat parts this scope 3 emission you know you know microsoft said they do it you know they will probably do it you know uh, you know that gives me sort of a bit of uh, belief that it can be done but how can this be done this scope 3 you know you whenever you go people say yeah this is very complex we, we really don't know can this be done yeah but it, it's complex and and I, I would even add another layer of complexity uh, instead of solving um <laughs> you get you, one you get yeah. one Jan. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> i mean um you also have to look at the the product that you make and how they save energy at your uh, customers uh, so okay. if we okay. if we produce um a batch of materials then we have a footprint yeah, we try to make it as low as possible, but we have a footprint. Mm -hmm. But that is intended to make a mobility uh, less, um, a bit, a bit lower CO2 footprints. And so, um, how to include all those impacts in 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 in, in the company footprints? That's indeed hard to say. And and indeed, um, that's why in our reporting we uh, we we focus on uh, scope one and scope two. So meaning our own um, footprint uh, and, and also the footprint of our energy supply. Um, but um, yeah, the embedded footprint in, in your raw materials, for instance, that's why we are uh, focusing a lot on, on recycling. But it's indeed hard to uh, to calculate all those things. Huh? I, I, I'm not quite familiar with, with, with uh, for instance, how do you uh, report the CO2 footprint of your product if it contains recycled materials. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is a lot of, of, of people talking about it and, and, and all kinds of models, but at a certain moment we have to agree 
uh, how we do it and then uh, report consistently. But we are not yet there. So in, when, when uh, Peter was talking about recycled content in, in the batteries, uh, who will get the, the credits for that? Uh, so um, that, that's also scope three. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you, uh, Jan. I, I take it you're not yet quite there. <laughs> You'll get there eventually. And uh, maybe we go now to Milan and then you, Kari, you were sort of uh, making the point about Scope 3. Perhaps a bit later you, you can shed some light. Uh, Milan, what is, uh, in, what's the main points in the chat? Thank you, Christian. Uh, so we have a number of questions. Uh, uh, first of Primarily addressed uh, to Director Kawaguchi. Um, the first, perhaps, uh, is about uh, the tremendous amount of uh, low carbon electricity that uh, is always going to be needed to decarbonize industry. Uh, but then nuclear power might again be on the table. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Um, then uh, beyond the industrial dimension, someone in the chat raised uh, the issue of uh, also really changes in behavioral consumption patterns. Should we consume less? And what are uh, Japan's ideas about that? Also in light of um, sort of minimalist ideas that have mm -hmm. on occasion been popular in Japan. Uh, and then uh, we had one other question already raised a little bit by Christian that um, yeah, the pressure uh, to move towards more decarbonization seemed to have come from business. Um, so why did it take until uh, yeah, October last year for that to, to really lead to, to policy change? And then maybe I would like to add one uh, question of myself more on uh, also on the European side. Uh, the issue of, uh, of leakage has been raised, but we also saw that um, already today, um, the, the energy intensity of some industrial products of Japan is lower. If they move ahead with the green growth strategy that might continue also in other sectors, so there might be leakage problems, but not carbon leakage problems. In fact, trade could then uh, work in the favor of, um, of lowering emissions. So what are the thoughts on that? Thank you. Uh, yeah, Kawaguchi-san, there were some to you. Maybe also Yukari may pick up uh, some of those. Uh, and who else wants uh, to come in, uh, please? Okay, oh, I, I need to, I should be quick, uh, but the one question was about nuclear, and uh, of course uh, it's a really uh, difficult issue, and uh, actually yesterday there was uh, uh, the, just a day which uh, the earthquake, in the big earthquake in Japan has happened, and the 10 year has been passed, but still the, uh, pro, uh, the issue exists. You know, and uh, let me think uh, like this way, you know, when we need, uh, think about the decarbonization, the primary energy need to come from the only three elements. One is from uh, renewable, and another is, of course, from nuclear. And also the other is thermal plus CCS. So oh, basically, the, you know, primary energy need to come from there. And then there is, of course, the, a limit to the renewable. We cannot, of course, we hope to get the energy all 100% from renewable, but it, it, there is a difficulty. And also, if we look at the CCS, there is also uh, storage capacity, and also nuclear power, uh, there is a, a you know a limitation. So or, what I want to say is, those need to be balanced when we think about the uh, 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 carbon neutrality in terms of the economics and the security, and also the decarbonization. Uh, so or, again, one question, it's really uh, difficult, especially, especially uh, when we think about the current status. And uh, that's why we need uh, innovation, that's uh, one thing. And also lifestyle issue, uh, I, I'm not familiar with a mini minimalist uh, issue. But again, you know, of course, lifestyle uh, style is um, different among the region or country. But uh, there is uh, some kind of the commonality if it we can solve by the uh, technology again, you know, or you know, you know, every people I think uh, need to be comfortable. But sometimes we need energy or CO two emission. But sometimes a new technology like a smartphone and so on 
the, those kind of technology can solve the difference in lifestyle change. So that's again, the issue of the uh, innovation. One thing about the leakage issue and that there is a discussion about the, uh, you know, or, or your trade and climate and also leakage. And uh, I think, uh, you know, or from the government point of view, uh, uh, you know, and uh, I think if you look at that issue from the private companies, I think that uh, kind of the uh, uniform room or uh, uniform uh, rule or regulation is uh, essential, you know, because, you know, when we look at the border carbon adjustment issue, one thing which we need to think of is again, how we can measure the scope three or the, how we can measure the carbon con content. You know, the measurement methodology, it might be different Parent from the EU and Japan and also other countries. So uniform uh, uh, measurement method is important and how we can measure the carbon pricing. So uh, what important is, you know, that's why the EU and Japan has a kind of a EPA uh, issue and uh, there is a, a, a chance to talk about the uh, uh, legal uh, uh, uniformity. So again, uh, you know, there is a burden to the company so that, uh, you know, all the things uh, we need to address on those kind of the uh, burden and the uniformity of the uh, uh, regulation or rules or standard. That's the one thing. Thank you very much. Yeah, I just should add that there were a couple of comments on the presentations and they all said great presentations, excellent presentations. Thank you. I should also uh, convey uh, that message uh, to the speakers. Uh, Yukari, you, you have something to add? Yeah, I, I think I see uh, one question coming to me, uh, which is the why the, I'm sorry to say that to come up with some, but the, 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 the questions say that the why the government had not respond for fee decarbonization up until just last year, uh, until the, uh, you know, the declaration announcement of the prime minister, uh, our prime minister. I think in, in my sense, uh, already the government had uh, a preparation to announce uh, already, uh, you know, the announce the somehow the decarbonization uh, uh, around the uh, mid century, for instance, the uh, the our long term strategy uh, uh, under the Paris Agreement already submitted to the United Nations already mentioned that our long term goal is the uh, realize the carbonized society uh, as soon as possible after uh, 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 you know the uh, twenty fifty. But uh, uh, um, I think the one of the reason or one of the difficulty that government face the uh, you know the uh, not really easy to accelerate the carbonization policy is that uh, I think yeah, that's such kind of thing happen of what the decarbonization mean especially for Japan uh, that means that energy transition so the uh, conventional uh, 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 utility companies or the energy intensive or emission intensive industry are not so, uh, you know, the happy or the, if I could say, uh, were reluctant to take additional uh, climate action quickly. But uh, uh, as I mentioned that uh, Sony, like a business, uh, demand side business are uh, facing the, uh, you know, request from the supply chain they become, uh, you know, the increasingly vocal, so that the uh, finally the supply side, of, for instance, the utility company decide to change their business portfolio toward the more decarbonized energy, uh, you know, the, the supply. So I think that's that's why that's our government and now they could clearly mention that this decarbonization goal more clearly mean that 20, uh, you know, climate neutrality by 2050. So sometimes it takes, but uh, now the, you know, the supply side and then also demand side businesses uh, of Japan is quite then the, uh, you know, collaborate toward to achieve this uh, policy. So that I, I think it's a really mature time to do it. That's my answer, thank you. Thank you, uh, Jan, Peter, you want to add something? <laughs> Uh, well, uh, if I may, I, I would like to add a comment on uh, consuming less. I said the question on consuming less. Um, 
sometimes people ask, will there be enough raw materials for all this uh, clean mobility? And then I answer them, well, I guess we can do it with half of the amount that you estimate. If you look at mobility today and cars, uh, a car is used about 5% of the time. So 95% of the time, the car is idle somewhere at the curbside or in the garage, and it's not used. If we could go to other, other models of consumption and the car is shared or, or uh, used in another way, but that it is 10% of the time used, that's not quite ambitious, 10% of the time. But then we could do the same mobility with only half of the materials. Can you imagine our society that for every two cars, we see one car? What a, uh, what a dimension, uh, free space we would have, and we would do the same mobility with only half of the material. And I think that we have to move, and, and when we talk about sustainability and production and less, lower carbon footprint, etc., we also have to look at the efficiency of use of materials. And as a material technology company, we are not afraid of that. We do not say that that would be uh, harming our business model. No, our business model is to put materials on, on the, in the economy to take it back and to let it turn. It's like money. If you can run your business with one million or with half a million, well, you will do it with half a million. Huh? Uh, so materials should also be looked at this way. Uh, so not be idle in the streets or in the garage, but be used and, and turning all around. Thank you. Um, Peter, anything to add before we go to Milan, who had picked up uh, the one or the other question again? Yeah, uh, just, just to say that <clears throat> the whole idea of rethinking how we consume is, is a core part of the European Union circular economy. You know, clearly, as Jan said, if you... Um, if you don't treat something as your own personal good, but you want a service, you want to be moved around or you want to be have communication facilities or whatever, the whole idea of products becoming services and who actually needs to own that asset uh, and who takes the responsibility for, for how it's designed, how it's uh, re reused, remanufactured or, or, or recycled at the end, that's, that's our circular economy action plan. Um, we also think that there's huge untapped potential of raw materials that are in the economy, too much goes into landfill, or we export stuff that we could make better use of uh, in Europe. Um, but finally, we will always need a certain amount of virgin raw materials. The question is, what's the, what's the mix? And how sustainably can you still do that to that greenfield uh, raw material uh, extraction and processing? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Jan, uh, people agree with you. So we stop here before we get too much, uh, you know, harmony. Uh, Milan, uh, could you, uh, you know, there were more, a few more questions or points to raise? Yes, indeed. Um, and maybe this is a good moment to also get back a bit to some of the, the more harder decarbonization factors, carbon capture and use or storage and hydrogen. Uh, the first on CCUS then is that um, Japan, but also the EU to some extent, uh, really talk about utilization of CO2 as well, but it's not always permanent. It might make it easier to justify investment in carbon capture, um, but uh, are there also concerns about the permanence there in Japan? Um, will you actually store it? Uh, is that um, yeah, feasible to do? And then on the hydrogen uh, side, where will it come from? Will you import it? Is there also a link to CCUS there? Or uh, would you also uh, really try to go the green hydrogen route as is uh, yeah, quite popular in the EU at the moment? Uh, yeah. Yukihiro, uh, can you comment on Yukari? Okay, uh, uh, on CCS and CCU, actually, I have uh, the, the, uh, the uh, symposium on CCS and CCU yesterday together with Takamura-san. And uh, well, and uh, actually, you know, or, or CCS uh, and CCU, and uh, there's, uh, of course, uh, perm the permanence uh, of the uh, problem on CCU. But uh, I think this is the same situation as the EU. When we look at the CCS, uh, you know, 
one way to uh, introduce the CCS to the society is how we can uh, combine CCS together with CCU because that makes, you know, first when we gather CCS and in one region, and then we can utilize it in, in as a CCU. But and then by doing so, we can uh, make the value uh, on the CO2. And, uh, and also uh, that means uh, that there is a generation of uh, economy in this region. But as well, you know, uh, the CCU can cannot deal with all the CO2 emission. That's why the, the rest of the CO2 need to be put into the underground. So that's why I think this is also the case in the uh, uh, Amsterdam in the CCUS cluster and also the cluster in the uh, UK. So that, that kind of the uh, clustering of CCS and CCUS is also being uh, introduced in Japan uh, in some demonstration site. Uh, that's one idea. And on the hydrogen, you know, or ideally it could, it could come from all the uh, green, but also uh, there is a limitation on the uh, green uh, hydrogen. So that's why Japan sees the potential uh, of the blue hydrogen as well. And uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, we need a CCS uh, to get the blue hydrogen. And again, uh, going back to the potential of CCS, uh, we can, uh, when we look at the potential, not only in Japan, but in Asia or in Australia, which is uh, close to Japan, uh, there is a large potential of the uh, CCS as well as blue or green hydrogen. So one demonstration project between Australia and Japan is we, we try to bring hydrogen from Australia to Japan, and then we can use that hydrogen. So uh, by uh, thinking about this issue cross-border, we can have many potential. That could be the same to, uh, between Japan and the EU. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Maybe if I may, a short remark on, on hydrogen. Uh, we should not never forget that hydrogen is not a source of energy, but an energy carrier. And so wind and solar energy has to be converted into hydrogen before, and, and then it can be used uh, to, to transport. And indeed, um, if there is a an, region like Australia, where there is a lot of sun, but less consumption, it's a way to transport solar energy uh, from Australia to, to for instance, to, to Japan. Eh? Uh, but if it is indeed an, an, an alternative to, let's say, uh, electric mobility and then to use fuel cell cars, uh, there we believe that um, the energy efficiency to convert solar and wind into mobility, it's much better to use electricity in, in the form of, of a battery than in a fuel cell. There will be always some, some, some niche markets and, and dedicated applications where uh, the energy density is very important, like in planes or, or long distance trucks. Um, uh, but we are quite neutral in this because uh, we produce also uh, materials for fuel cells. So, uh, uh... yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jan. Uh, that will be an area where we'll be discussing the next, uh, you know, <laughs> five to 10 years or, or longer. Indeed, indeed. Um, Yukari, I was uh, struck when you, you mentioned a bit in passing, so let me hook on this, the regulatory reform and the digitalization, which we always mention, certainly digitalization, but then we don't quite, uh, you know, clarify what we mean with that. Uh, but I was particularly intrigued in the regulatory reform. What kind of, in broad lines, do you mean we require as regulatory reform? Of course, we know uh, the circularity. Uh, Peter, many others have mentioned. Uh, Jan, we, we have uh, our global, national, and, and European frameworks do not work. So what is, are the main themes for this regulatory reform, just at a high level, you would suggest? Um. Thank you. Uh, I hope that I could respond to, you know, appropriately to your question, Christian. But uh, uh, well, I talk it's a about... difficult question. I agree. Yeah, uh, in, uh, <laughs> we only pose it to the best. <laughs> for, for, no, I, I thought that the uh, that is one of the area that uh, we could learn each other between, uh, you know, EU and Japan and vice versa. Uh, for instance, the, uh, we talk about the new technology like the hydrogen or, or the CCUS. Mm. Uh, often we have now, uh, you know, the uh, regulatory framework given uh, to introduce or to diffuse these technologies so that the, 
Uh, one of the example, maybe I, I think you definitely Kawaguchi Sam know better than me, but uh, for instance, to introduce the CCUS, you know, the, there is now, uh, you know, clear uh, regulatory framework in Japan, so that how then the, uh, we could establish such kind of, you know, the, you know, the regulatory framework better uh, adapt to the in, uh, more, more diffusion of such, uh, you know, the uh, technology. I think it's similar to the hydrogen and other new technology. So that, that is, I think, one of the areas that for, for that reason, to, to uh, the, the learning and doing uh, area for, for both countries. So that, that is my sense in my presentation. Okay, thank you. I'm, 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 I'm Peter, I don't think I exaggerate. I think the EU is quite good in uh, you know, cooperating on best practice with its partners uh, going out and say, this is how we did it. Uh, you know, here is, is good lessons, there are failures, et cetera, et cetera. And in part, it's, it's part of the DNA and I'm sure much of this uh, will happen. Now I'm looking to time, uh, we are uh, finished. Uh, we are all about finished. So let me, if, if there is no urgent comment to be made, let me uh, close this meeting or the series, the, the, the small series of meeting. Uh, it was a uh, fascinating discussions to see how the EU and Japan uh, relate to each other, align on, on many of the points, a lot of similarities. Uh, Peter mentioned it, the challenges, uh, the approaches, but also uh, the cooperative uh, uh, ways of, of, of doing things. So here are the similarities. I don't want uh, to go into them in more detail. We had it in two webinars already. Uh, I, I pick up four points randomly, uh, maybe. I was intrigued by this strong uh, presence in the discussions on the non-regulatory side. Uh, you know, we had the supply chain pressure, the global sustainable finance, which we have in Brussels as well, the discussion, but also the, the municipalities. So that is something in the EU, which is, to my taste, Peter may correct me, uh, a little bit less uh, present. Then I second was I pick up the point that uh, with 20% of global GDP, uh, you know, is it possible that EU and Japan actually creates demand for these low carbon products, which we have outlined in the Green Deal, which Peter is working on, uh, and which is also at the core of the, the green growth strategy, if I understand that uh, correctly. That's better than having just a European uh, demand. And then if you expand tend this a little bit to the external dimension of the green growth strategy of the green deal uh, maybe we get uh, we can push up a little bit further and that gets you closer to the well to the standard setting to what we tend to believe uh, is the brussels effect but of course if there is a beijing effect that's much bigger <laughs> than what we can be uh, doing here uh, i think the, the the third part which is mentioned at the end is this this cooperation on regulatory reform best practices etc cetera, etc cetera. it's happening but you know if it can be scaled up uh, if, you, if you know if you close ranks and do it together it's uh, you know, th there could be a lot of opportunities for Japan in Asia. We are probably more present in, Japan is probably more present in Asia than the European Union will ever be. And of course, uh, vice versa. And then finally, I, I, I was, you know, I think it's getting more and more important to get around this issue of carbon accounting measurement, uh, scope three. Uh, and if Microsoft does it, my God, you know, they must have an idea of how to do this. <laughs> Uh, and uh, and so on. Maybe this is, is important also to weed out what Jan mentioned several times. There is a lot of double accounting, which is logical because we have regulatory parts and then we have, uh, you know, like the companies, they have no obligations, so they can do whatever they do. So obviously you get overlap there, but if you could sort of bring that together, we would have a much clearer uh, direction. So uh, that's that's it. We are at, uh, you know, 11.31. So forgive me for this uh, minute, 11 hour, uh, one hour time. So we have a working day ahead of us. You have a, a weekend uh, ahead of you. So please, <laughs> yeah, he's laughing. <laughs> I think he has good plans, uh, it seems. Uh, so let me uh, finish here uh, and thanking all uh, the speakers and also the participants for spending the time with us 
and engaging in this what I thought a fascinating uh, discussion. And I should also just say it took us until 11, 12 uh, century European time to get into the CBAM discussion, but only very briefly. So we could book this meeting as a meeting where we had climate change without a CBAM uh, discussion. I think that would be a fair uh, conclusion. So thank you all. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day, the evening, and I hope to see you soon again in these of these discussions. So thank you. The meeting is closed. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.